a gravitational wave would have what kind of frequency, what kind of amplitude compared to electromagnetic radiation we're more familiar with? Typically, a much lo a longer wavelength and lower frequency. Two black holes orbiting each yeah. other uh, uh, will emit waves with a uh, frequency with a period that is the period of orbital motion around the uh, that the two black holes undergo. That period for black holes that weigh uh, ten times the mass of the sun, it's about a hundred rotations per second, a hundred cycles per second in these waves. A wavelength of something like 3,000 kilometers or so. So huge. So huge wavelengths, wavelengths like the size of the Earth. Right. I'm sitting here in a uh, laboratory, uh, not a lab that I work in, but a laboratory of a project I helped found, the so-called uh, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Uh, we have just through the wall here, we have a 40 meter uh, gravitational wave detector it was a prototype for huge detectors that my colleagues uh, in this field have built and are operating at various sites around the world. Looking out today, operating at design sensitivity in the first year of collecting data, looking for these gravitational waves that are produced by black holes orbiting each other. It's an exciting time for me. We've been pushing uh, to uh, get this field of gravitational wave astronomy off the ground uh, and begin our first observations of the warped side of the universe, and we're on the threshold. It could come, these waves could come, and we could begin to explore the properties of black holes in exquisite detail. These waves could come this year. We may have to wait for a, a small improvement in these detectors uh, that uh, will be made in 2009-2010. We know that if we don't see them by then, I think we've got a good shot of seeing them, at least by then, that a big upgrade uh, that we expect to do beginning in 2011, uh, for which we are uh, laying all the foundations today, that that big upgrade will bring us to the point where we are seeing collide, merging black holes spiral together and collide with each other. We are seeing them uh, once a day, once a week. And we'll do beautifully detailed, rich observations of that and we'll begin our efforts to uh, probe the birth of the universe, the Big Bang singularity, and other objects on the warp side of the universe. What type of sensitivity do you need in these instruments to be able to detect it first and then to develop these detailed maps? These instruments have pushed the technology of high precision measurement far beyond any other human endeavor, far beyond what people imagined was possible two decades ago. Today, uh, just through this wall, the technology is operating to be able to monitor the motion of mirrors. These are in instruments that operate by sending laser beams back and forth between mirrors that are widely separated by four kilometer distance, but it's 40 meters uh, through the wall here. Measure the motion of mirrors relative to each other as these mirrors are moved back and forth by the warping of space. Measure those motions to a precision of one one thousandth the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. Not, not the diameter of the atom, no. but the nucleus of the so, atom, so, which is 100,000 yeah, times smaller. That's right. That's okay. right. And uh, so, you, so you take a human hair and you go smaller than that, a uh, 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 human hair. Uh, I've got, I don't have these numbers yeah, precise, yeah, yeah. but you go, you go smaller by something like a factor of 10 million, uh, 100 million, you get down to the size of an atom, you go down another 100,000, you get to the nucleus of an atom, you go down another 1,000, and that's the accuracy with which my colleagues, uh, a technique that uh, was uh, first pioneered by Rainer Weiss, and he and Ron, Ron Drever uh, here at Caltech, he at MIT, then together with me founded this project. Uh, Drever and Weiss laid the technical foundations more than anyone else. Uh, they've developed these techniques, they and their colleagues, to the point that they can make these measurements of this exquisite accuracy. Let me put that in another perspective. When we do the big upgrade in a few years, we will be monitoring the motion of mirrors that then will weigh 40 kilograms, about 100 pounds, about, about this size, made of quartz, to about a factor of uh, 10 times better, about uh, one ten thousandth the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. This is a precision 
and, and, and what's being measured is the motion of the center of mass, the average position of all of the atoms in, that, in this huge mirror that's like the size of you and me, to such exquisite accuracy that we see the, this mirror behave not according to the laws of classical physics, but the laws of quantum physics. The position of that mirror is not well defined, it's fuzzy, it's described by quantum mechanics by a so-called Schrodinger wave function. Uh, there's only a certain probability that it's here versus there versus <laughs> there over distances that are one ten thousandth of the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. But uh, over those distances, this human-sized object is governed by quantum mechanics. Wow. And so we have had to develop a whole new uh, technology to deal with this, so-called quantum non-demolition technology. <laughs> Don't let quantum mechanics get in the way <laughs> of gravity waves. Wow. Unbelievable. So as, as you would hope in the future to reflect back on the grand structure of the universe, what might gravity waves in, in all their richness bring to it? The ultimate question that gravity waves will begin to answer, I believe, hand in hand with theory, is what was the nature of the birth of the universe? Gravitational waves are the only form of radiation that could have been created in the very birth of the universe and traveled unscathed, unscathed by scattering off ma matter, unscathed by being absorbed, uh, unscathed from the birth to us today. So they are the tool to observe observationally, to directly observe the birth of the universe. We don't know how strong the waves are from the birth of the universe. The best guess is that they are at a level that we will need a, instruments that go uh, one step beyond LIGO and one step beyond LIGO's analog, LISA. LISA is a space-based version of LIGO that will study gravitational waves from huge black holes. We'll explore big warp, warping in the universe. We will go from one step beyond those two to something called Big Bang Observer, uh, the next generation, which will have the sensitivity to see the best predictions for how strong the waves are from the birth of the universe. But we don't understand the birth of the universe. The waves could be stronger. They're not likely to be much weaker than that. They could be somewhat weaker than that best prediction. They could be stronger. And uh, so we are looking now with LIGO. We will look with LISA. We will look by other techniques. And I am quite sure that by 2000, 25, 2030, 35, in that time frame at least, if not sooner, we will be observing the birth of the universe in several different wavelength bands using gravitational waves. In the meantime, string theory will have become much more mature, or, and I don't think it's likely, will have been disproved in some way. Uh, but it will, uh, this, the quantum gravity, this merging of these two sets of physical laws, quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, will have been merged sufficiently to really address, begin to address with some confidence the details of the birth of the universe. Already, they can address it to some degree, but it will become sufficiently mature that we will be able to go back and forth between these observations with gravitational waves, also observations of uh, what else is out in the universe, but not direct observations of the birth go back and forth between observations, primarily gravitational waves, and the theory, and really understand the creation of all that we see around us.